I have a sine graph made with Desmos, and I'm going to do something I did in class a few weeks ago, uh, looking at the slope of this sine graph. So you should be at a point now where you understand that sine of x, this is the graph, sine of x, this being the y-axis, and this is my x-axis. And sine of x starts at 0, so sine of 0 is 0. Sine of pi over 2, that's right about here, is going to be 1. And then we have sine of pi, which is right here, is 0. And then sine of minus pi over 2, which is right about here, or sorry, 3 pi over 2, is minus 1. And then sine of 2 pi, which is over here, is 0 again. So that's something you should have already done in your pre-calc, in your Algebra 2 classes. Um, but I want to look more at what's going on with the slope of this sine function. So the slope of the sine function is always changing. If I look at the slope at the tippy top and the very bottom, that's where the slope is zero. The slope has a maximum value every time it crosses the horizontal axis. It's a maximum value in the positive direction this way, and then it's maximum values in the negative direction that way. And I want to graph the slope of the sine function at all points. So I don't know what the actual value of the slope is. I'm not going to actually try to calculate it. It actually looks like about 1 right here. So that's I'll go with that. The, so the value of the slope at this point is going to be 1. The value of the slope over here is 0. The value of the slope here is negative 1. And the value of the slope here is 0. So on and so forth. 1 is going to be again over here. We can look at the same thing. This value of the slope is 0 here. And the value of the slope at this point is it's going to be in the negative direction. So it's down here. And the value of the slope over here is 0. And value of the slope here is 1. And I know that the slope between these two regions, when it goes from maximum to zero slope up here at the top, in this region, it's smoothly changing. So the slope is less here, and it gets to be less and less and less. So it's a smoothly changing slope at all points. Use a different color to connect all these dots. So that means the slope is gradually changing to zero. And then it's gradually changing to negative 1. And then it's gradually changing back to 0. And it's gradually changing back to positive 1. And I can follow that over here. And this blue curve that I've created is something that should look very familiar. Sine of x at 0, sine of 0 is 0, but cosine of 0 is positive 1. And cosine of pi is negative 1. And cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So the blue graph is actually cosine of x. So what the cosine of x graph represents one way you can think of it is it represents the slope of the graph of sine of x. So this leads us to a setup where I have one set of coils or one coil 
driven by an AC signal generator. And then I have another coil next to or around the other coil, could be inside, could be outside, and I'm going to measure the voltage on the output of that coil. Now if these coils are close enough, maybe they're concentric or maybe they're just close together, this is an AC signal generator. If I have an AC signal generator, that means within the first coil here, I will have voltages that are induced because I will induce voltages based on a rule of inductance. So I will induce voltages from a changing current from an AC signal generator and these induced voltages also will create magnetic fields that will induce voltages in the next coil over. And I can read those voltages. Those voltages also, if they're induced, could push currents to whatever happens to be connected to the terminals of the secondary coil. And I can look at this over here. I have an input current that is in pink. And I have an induced voltage in a secondary coil that is in green. So I'll label these with the pink and the green. So I have pink. I'm looking at my induced voltage, or sorry, my input current. So I'm going to say I have a current meter in series in the circuit. And then I have a voltage that I'm measuring on the secondary coil in green. And I can look at this in the same way that I looked at this graph. So if I consider what, what is the slope of the triangle signal, the triangular current, so current is going, let's go back to my pink color, current's going one way, and then it flips, and then it goes the other way, and then goes one way. So the current's going back and forth, and it's changing, um, so the current is in many ways, actually I could say that a little better, the current is starting at from this point, it starts at zero, and the current is steadily increased, and then it gets to a maximum value, and the current steadily decreases all the way down to a minimum value, and then so on, it steadily increases to a maximum value, and it keeps doing that. And it has this abrupt change at a couple points. How does this manifest itself in the output voltage on that secondary coil. Well, the current slope at this point is pretty constant. So, and it's a, the slope is positive here, and then the current abruptly changes its change. And so the slope of the current, the change in the current, is steadily decreasing to a negative and then it abruptly changes, and these abrupt changes line up with these shifts in voltage. So the output voltage is constant at a low value, then it flips to be constant at a high value, then it flips to be constant at a low value. So the induced voltage, the voltage read on the secondary coil, is representing the slope of the current graph. But this matches up with our rule of inductance where we have V induced is equal to some minus L. So that's our actual inductance value for the, the number of coils and the size of the coils in the inductor times the change in current over change in time. But if I get rid of that L, let's look at it just as the induced voltage is, and I'll color code this, V 
V induced is proportional to minus delta I over delta T. Well, delta I over delta T for a current versus time graph, this is the slope of a of an I versus time graph. And there is a minus sign in front of this as well. So that's why even though this is a positive slope here, the voltage induced is negative. And this is a negative slope here, so the voltage induced is positive. So the induced voltage on a secondary coil is going to mimic the slope of the input current on the primary coil. This is a wireless signal transmission because the way this gets set up, there is no direct electrical connection. And we can see the same thing if my induced or my, my input current is the pink still and that happens to be some kind of cosine looking wave. And then my output voltage is offset from that, representing the slope. So I can send a signal from one wire to another. They don't have to be touching, but it's not going to be the same signal out as it is in. But that doesn't matter if I want to send information. I can agree upon what kind of processing might be done. And if I want to just generate voltages wirelessly, that's good too. But the big thing here is what we've created is, in some sense, a derivative machine for those of you in calculus, that the output voltage is representing minus the slope of the input current.